Hi, I'm Mark Newman, author of the Super Uper books about an environmental superhero who's guarding the Great Lakes from invasive species. There are four books. The first book, Super Uper Environmental Defender, I wrote with my close friend and collaborator, Mark Heckman, a colorful, bigger than life artist who believed that art has the responsibility, not just the power, to speak to the masses. His methods disprove the conventional perspective that art must possess the stamp of museum or gallery approval to be validated. Employing equal measures of art, advertising, and showmanship, Mark believed the true value of art was in addressing social, political, and environmental issues in ways that spoke to common people. Now, let's start by going back in time. Way back in time. Back to when I was a young boy and a lot cuter. Like many kids, I liked art. And while I got better as I got older, I discovered my real passion was writing. I loved reading, I loved books. I even created a newspaper for one project. I thought being a writer might be a lot of fun, but I really wanted to grow up and be a pro baseball player, maybe play for the Detroit Tigers. Guess what happened? It didn't happen. I struck out. But that's okay, because in eighth grade, my teacher said, Mark, I've read some of your papers. I think you should think about being a writer. I think you can make writing your job, your career. So I tell kids, listen to your teachers. Sometimes they have wise things to say, right? Well, I listened to my teacher, and so after high school, I went to college. I went to Michigan State University, where I studied journalism. Learned how to write for newspapers, magazines, books, but more importantly, how to research, how to investigate, how to learn about science in the Great Lakes. Because when I was in school, science, not my favorite subject. But over time, the more I learned, the more interesting it became. And eventually I thought, wait a minute, I love science now. So I tell kids, always be prepared for where your career path may eventually take you. It's good to learn a lot of different subjects. While I was still in college, I started working for a daily newspaper. I started in the sports department, then entertainment. In the process, I interviewed a lot of famous people. I interviewed Magic Johnson, Willie Nelson, Ozzy Osbourne, Bon Jovi, Ray Charles, Mr. Rogers, rock group U2, Robin Williams, even Big Bird. I enjoyed writing longer pieces, so eventually I moved to magazines. I became the editor of this sports magazine. I went to Florida one year with the Tigers for spring training. I interviewed the guy in the cover. That's Sparky Anderson. He was the manager of the Tigers. That's Veda Pinson. He was their batting coach. I'm talking to him about the art of hitting a baseball. That's Alan Trammell. He was the Tigers' best player at the time. But to me, the most important person is the guy in the background, the guy who would become my close friend, Mark Heckman. The more we talked, the more we found out we had in common. We shared a lot of common interests, same music, movies, sports. In fact, our favorite two sports were probably baseball and hockey. I mentioned hockey. For the past 24 seasons, I've been the editor of this magazine, Graffiti. It's the magazine of the Grand Rapids Griffins. I get to go to games to interview guys like Anthony Mantha. He's one of their young stars. I'm also a photographer, so I'm at games taking pictures of, there's Datsuk and Zetterberg. They were two of the best Red Wing players for many, many years. Then they got old and they retired, and now the Red Wings are not so good. But it's still fun. When I go to games, it doesn't seem like work. In fact, I tell kids, when I go to games, it doesn't seem like work at all. In fact, I don't have to buy a ticket. They pay me to go to games. Yeah, they're paying me to go to games. So kids will go, oh, writing is boring. Well, here I am. I'm writing about science, sports, and superheroes. I think that sounds like fun. It is fun. Well, Mark and I found out we shared one more thing in common. The environment. We both believed in protecting the planet, the Earth. Because how many Earths do we have? Only one. Well, we better take care of it then. So Mark and I, we started talking. And we found out. He was already kind of getting his foot into the door of getting a lot of attention for various things. Himself, primarily, to start. 
In fact, he got in the news when he painted his girlfriend's portrait on the side of a rather famous lighthouse. Yeah, that wasn't such a good idea. Eventually, Mark found a more legitimate place for his work, painting large-scale murals for a number of West Michigan manufacturers. It also led him to take his brush to billboards, the 14 by 48 foot canvas being the ultimate mega medium for his message. When I met Mark, his focus was purely on self-promotion. He declared himself the world's best artist, then volunteered to become the first artist in space, inspired by the idea of Krista McAuliffe becoming the first teacher in space. Days later, his proposal sadly went up in smoke, no pun intended, when the Challenger space shuttle exploded. Mark, it seemed, was quite successful at getting media attention for his art. When we talked, I said, how do you accomplish this? And he said, it's actually quite easy. He said, I'll call the TV stations or newspaper when I have a new billboard. He said, I'll use different voices and I'll say, hello, have you seen that billboard out on the highway? Do you know what the story is behind it? I laughed. I said, seriously? He goes, yeah, it works quite well. I said, Mark, why don't you just send out a press release? He said, press release? I thought you have to be a big company to do press releases. I said, no. I said, the next time you have a project, I'll write a press release for you. He said, okay. And when we did, we were amazed at the amount of attention we got for that one billboard. And it was purely self-promotion. And we thought, wait a minute. If we got this kind of attention for self-promotion, why not put it to good use for an issue, whether it was a social issue or an environmental issue? And with that, a partnership was born. In the beginning, I simply wrote the press releases. One of our earliest efforts was Holy Ozone, a billboard about the greenhouse effect. Mark wanted to use the constructs of Hollywood its famous names, images, to take a lighter look at protecting the Earth's atmosphere. Over time, as we worked together, Mark started to ask for more and more of my input. In many ways, we were on the same wavelength. Over the years, Mark and I tackled a lot of issues that impact our planet, that impact our lives. Some big, some small. For example, Mark said this may not bother everyone, but it really bugs me when people go to Lake Michigan to smoke their cigarettes and they throw them all over the sand like it's a giant ashtray. He said, that's not good. I go, no, they're polluting the beach. He said, could we do a billboard about it? I said, sure, we'll make it look like an ad for a brand new beach, but it'll be covered in cigarette butts. We'll call it Menthol Beach and say it's breathtaking. Not because it's a pretty view, but because it's pretty disgusting, and cigarettes can literally take your breath away. We put up the billboard, sent out a press release, and a newspaper wrote a story about it. We had a TV commercial produced to bring more attention to the billboard, and before we knew it, we had all these people calling us. They said, can we help? Can we have a beach cleanup day? And on a Saturday, we had parents and about 50 kids show up and we gave every one of them a garbage bag. We were amazed, you would have been amazed at how many hundreds and hundreds of cigarette butts, along with bottles, cans, trash, litter, they collected off that one beach. And that was pretty cool, because every time we did a billboard, the whole idea was to get people thinking, get them talking as they were driving down the road or walking down the street past it, get them asking, what's that about? What's the message? So when people actually said, let's change that, let's make a difference, we thought that was pretty awesome. Mark had been fortunate to create the logo for actor Dustin Hoffman's production company, so we decided to play off the name of one of his famous films, Little Big Man. We created Litter Big Man to ask how people could keep polluting and not recycling. We also went back in time to find inspiration from the old TV series Lost in Space and the robot who proclaimed, that does not compute. Instead, we called it Lost in Waste and the robot says, that does not compost. We also addressed the importance of trees and the subject of deforestation. Mark said, if we cut down all the trees, all the rainforests in the world, 
never worried about replanting the trees we use. He said that'd be like a horror movie, a world with no trees, no rainforest. I said, you're right. Let's do a billboard that looks like a horror movie poster about our trees. Mark said, great idea. We can use my old girlfriend to pose for it. We called it Chainsaw Massacre. She's screaming in horror because someone with a chainsaw cut down all the trees. So what? Why should we care? Trees don't give us anything, right? Other than oxygen, the air we breathe. No trees, no paper. I wouldn't have any books. No books, no libraries. No paper, no homework. Hey teachers, good idea. Do we eat anything from trees? Of course, think of all the fruit. Apples, pears, peaches, cherries, oranges, coconuts, bananas. How about pancakes? Well, pancakes don't grow on trees, but maple syrup comes from maple trees. Habitat for animals. Birds, squirrels, chipmunks, raccoons, owls, insects. Wood. Wood for houses, furniture, tables, chairs. There are things you don't even think about. No trees? Detroit Pistons? They're out of work. No basketball courts. No wood floors. Detroit Tigers? No baseball bats. They're out of work. Music you listen to would be different if there had never been a single tree. Why? Think of violins, guitars, cellos, pianos, drumsticks. Shopping. What do you pay with? Well, maybe your credit card, but money. You know, there's a saying, money doesn't grow on trees. Kind of does. Trees are obviously an important part of our ecosystem. When the office furniture company Herman Miller decided to stop using wood from old growth forests, they enlisted our help to publicize that fact with a series of three billboards. We also did billboards about gun control, melanoma, and the importance of sunscreen. We looked at the subject of nuclear waste, as well as the issue of global warming. When a local hospital wanted to celebrate the survivors of childhood diseases, we asked for the help of these former patients to create a billboard in their honor. Mark traced the outline of their bodies, and then the kids painted in their own figures to create a billboard we called Daydream Believers. We did a billboard about the homeless using rap lyrics from Vanilla Ice and MC Hammer, who were big at the time. I play the part of the cold, freezing homeless man who says, it's like ice, ice, baby. Mark is a young professional holding the hamburger and declaring, you can't touch this. We had an actual rap group create a song in conjunction with our efforts, and the song got played on the radio in Chicago. The whole idea behind the billboard is that people often give the homeless a bum rap. We look down on them when we don't know their complete circumstances. Did they lose their jobs? Are they battling mental illness? Here's another. For years, Truna fisheries were responsible for the senseless killing of countless dolphins in their nets. We decided the travesty deserved a billboard, creating a fake product to call attention to this issue. Flipper can dolphin, the seafood that tuna lovers are killing for. The press release said it was art with a purpose. In 1991, Saddam Hussein set fire to hundreds of oil fields in Kuwait, a monumental disaster for the environment in the Middle East. Mark said, we need to do a billboard. Crude dude was the result. After a week, we took the billboard down so Mark could dress like Uncle Sam and bomb Saddam with red, white, and blue paint. Here's a news story about the event. The crude dude billboard was brought from its location along a freeway to a parking lot on 28th Street, where the anti-Saddam art was laid out for bombing in patriotic colors. It's the work of artist Mark Heckman, who arrived in a limo dressed as Uncle Sam. I want you! I want you! Heckman is known for art that's often street theater. He gets a lot of attention for himself and for social causes, some of them controversial. Today, Heckman's crude dude attack drew about 150 spectators. He boarded a helicopter armed with red, white, and blue paint bombs to drop on Saddam's billboard head. After dropping the first one is when Heckman realized his kind of art can get hazardous. A giant plastic drop cloth was sucked up in the rotor draft and nearly engulfed the chopper. The pilot suddenly shifted into climb and outran it. 
But once Heckman got the range, he rained red, white, and blue all over Saddam. He called it bombing Saddam with patriotism. The artist made several passes at his billboard, creating splatter art with a political twist. Heckman plans to put the billboard back up in its new form on Monday. Back on the ground, Heckman found the crude dude theme was a crowd pleaser. Nice shooter, Art! Oh, it's tough. One man in the crowd had mixed feelings, wondering if this will be as funny if war erupts in the Middle East. But Heckman thinks people should express themselves about what's going on in the world, and in his case... Well, I'm an artist, and this is the way I do things. You know, I like to take things to the masses, and if people get an enjoyment out of this and think more about what's going on over there, I think it's great. And there may be something, too, using this kind of art to encourage others to express themselves. In Wyoming, Henry Earp, News 8. After the event, we put the billboard back up in its original location. Within several days, we were amazed when people climbed the height of the billboard to add their own colorful commentary. Our success in spreading our message eventually got the attention of other media outlets. A local radio station asked if we could come up with something to convert listeners to their airwaves. Father Knows Best was the result, showing Pope John Paul II wearing headphones and a WLAV t-shirt. In the press release, the station's general manager said, Our devout listeners are already aware of our new attitude. Our mission is to get the attention of those who have strayed from the flock. Needless to say, it proved controversial. Mark and I spent six hours on the air answering questions and defending its message. The radio station loved it. When the time came for a follow-up, the second billboard was obvious. None better. WLEV, make it a habit. By this time, Mark and I had developed a pattern of working together. We typically talked on the old-fashioned telephone, a way to focus our attention and keep distractions to a minimum. We could go back and forth for hours, throwing out one idea after another until one finally clicked. Mark was responsible for creating the image, I was in charge of the words and implementation. One serious subject we wanted to address was racism. We struggled for weeks trying our best to come up with an appropriate direction. We went back and forth with all kinds of ideas, but nothing was clicking this time. Finally, Mark said, what about golf? At the time, the Masters Tournament had been in the news because the host Augusta Country Club did not have any African-American members. This was long before Tiger Woods. Could we do something with golf as a metaphor? That's it, I said. What's the line, Mark asked. I don't know, but that's it. I'll come up with it. That night, as I was laying in bed, it came to me. What would happen if we flipped the issue around? Instead of an all-white country club, it was reversed. The answer was Afro Country Club, where only the ball is white. The next day, when I told Mark the idea, he howled. That's beautiful, he said. This one will be huge. So we presented the Afro Country Club concept to Gannett Outdoor, the billboard company in Grand Rapids. Their response? Their jaws dropped. Are you crazy? There's no way we'll put that up. We had prior contacts with Gannett in Detroit, so we approached them next. Their response? Are you kidding? This is Detroit. Remember the 1967 riots? Undeterred, we called Gannett in Chicago, our last hope. They loved the idea so much, they put it on the Tri-State, the busy I-294 Beltway outside the Windy City. We sent out our press release and booked a trip to Chicago. When we got there, we heard crickets. Nothing. Mark was despondent. Here we thought this was going to be our biggest billboard yet, and we were ignored. We made some calls, but nothing. After a day, Mark was ready to head back to Grand Rapids. I suggested we call the papers before we left. So we called them one more time to query their interest, and one of them said, meet us at the billboard that afternoon. Awesome! Armed with this information, we called the other paper, telling them that their competitor was hot on the story. They said they wanted an interview. We were in. We did the interviews, 
and then headed back to Grand Rapids. Not sure if we would get a short paragraph or maybe just a small photo. The next day, we were on the front page of the Chicago Sun-Times and page three of the Chicago Tribune. Suddenly, we were the talk of the town. Everybody and their brother wanted to talk to us. We were doing one interview after another. It was nuts. Chicago, it seems, has a ton of radio stations. Some questioned if we weren't trying to stir up trouble where none existed. Racism, they said, was a thing of the past. But in the Sun-Times article, it mentioned a survey where they had found only three black members among the more than 100 country clubs in the Chicago area, one of the members being basketball star Michael Jordan. This was September 1991, seven months before the Rodney King incident and the LA riots. Nearly 30 years later, people would be arguing whether Black Lives Matter was a worthy cause. Yeah, racism, a thing of the past. Anyway, a couple days later, the billboard was vandalized, spray painted with the letters KKK and the N-word. The mayor of the town where the billboard was located made a personal plea for the billboard to come down. He was worried about riots in his city, which was called, ironically, Justice, Illinois. As a result, the billboard got a second round of stories. Sensing that we had fully accomplished bringing attention to the issue, we agreed to remove the billboard, which led to a third round of stories. It was all pretty amazing. Not every effort was so serious. Mark wanted to commemorate the fact that Grand Rapids was the first city in the world to fluoridate its drinking water in 1945. We called it Operation Pearly White. Mark's idea was to create a giant tooth sculpture and put it on a pole in the middle of the Grand River. The mayor of Grand Rapids loved the idea, but a group of dentists opposed the idea because they had their own monument to promote. It led to a stalemate, so we put up a billboard with a punkish tooth fairy and we called it Tooth or Consequences. When that failed to sway the dentist, we took it a step further. We sent out hostage notes to the media. The first one said, Help, I am holding myself hostage until the tooth sculpture goes in the river, signed Heckman Artist. We attached a real tooth to each note, compliments of Mark's girlfriend, who was a dental hygienist. A few days later, we sent a second note with a photo of Mark bound and blindfolded, with all his teeth pulled except for one. Please help! Body parts next! Finally, we decided to stage a pseudo-unveiling of our proposal, which was covered by the local media. Here's one TV news story. Uh, we're bringing in the giant tooth. We're on our way to the Grand River. Uh, a lot of people are walking by. They're kind of amazed and amused. They didn't think it could really happen. How's it going? So, it's art to go. A mammoth molar monument on the move. Well, I mean, really, who's to say what's art? Maybe the whole gag was. With the help of morning radio personality Red Noise, artist Mark Heckman exposed his giant tooth to the city this morning. All week, Heckman's been sending notes to the media suggesting he was holding himself hostage and pulling out all his teeth because local officials responded to his tooth sculpture idea like they would to bad breath. So to bridge the communications gap, Heckman created a prototype tooth from styrofoam. Oh, this kind of stuff they use on docks. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We've seen a lot of Mark Heckman the last few years. His work is splashy and outrageous. He goes for big public displays like this. They promote the artist as much as the subject. Today, the goal was to put the replica tooth on a rock in the Grand River downtown. No guy get it on that rock yet. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's the part I forgot to tell you about. <laughs> So they lashed Big Tooth to a flat bottom boat and headed out with the artist on live drive time radio hyping his proposed molar on a mast, a much bigger fiberglass model on a pole in the middle of the Grand. It'd be a bigger tooth, but we wanted to prove that what a giant tooth sculpture in the river would look like and we've done that. Oh, it'd be awesome. And people would come to this city and talk about it. And that's what we want. We want everybody to know we're the first city in the world to fluoridate our water. That's the whole reason behind this project. 
The tooth never got onto the rock, but for a few minutes, people had a chance to get some idea of what Heckman's sculpture would look like. And Heckman had another chance to try to get the city to bite. For Live at 5.30, I'm Henry Earp. Naturally, not everything worked. Certainly, Mark enjoyed some success as an artist. He was commissioned to paint the portrait of President Ford for the state capitol in Lansing. We did billboards to promote the opening of the new Grand Rapids Art Museum, which we deemed art with a new twist, while Vincent declared he would give his left ear to go. One example of a great idea, we thought, that didn't succeed was Mark's boxing bags. Mark was represented by a Melrose Art Gallery in Los Angeles, and he staged a show that allowed him to use his physicality. The idea was to paint images or words that he felt strongly about and then use his paint-covered fist to take out his aggression on the canvas bags. Here's one example related to race. Unfortunately, the show flopped. Not a single bag sold. People thought they were cool, but in the end, we think the bags were too big and too heavy for most people's homes. More successful was his benefit show for cancer survivors. We turned the art gallery into Camel Funeral Home, using the Joe Camel character as the spokesman for the venue with the theme, Ashes to Ashes. Get it? For the first hour, Mark laid in a casket while visitors could pay their respects. That's actor Richard Belzer, who played Detective John Munch on TV's Law and & Order and 10 other shows. I delivered a eulogy before we carried the casket and Mark out to a waiting hearse, which drove around the block before returning to the welcoming crowd. Eventually, the major networks couldn't help but take notice. Here is ABC anchor Peter Jennings introducing a story that appeared on the evening news. Finally here this evening, one man's determination to be heard. We all know it isn't always easy to get your message across. There's just so much information packaged in so many ways. And so we were particularly impressed by the novel way in which an artist who happens to live in the Midwest has used a fairly traditional way of communicating to very successful effect. Here's ABC's Chris Bury. At first glance, the billboard going up in downtown Chicago could have been any ordinary ad. But then some folks did a double take. Oh, no, I get it. Oh, God, I feel terrible. It's called the bum rap, borrowing lyrics from two rap songs. It's like Ice yeah, Ice Baby, that. says the cold, hungry, and homeless man. You all. can't touch this, replies the young professional inside a cozy cafe. It's saying that people don't care about the homeless. If you're in need or down and out, keep walking. You know, don't stop by here. That's what I get. The billboard is the creation of Mark Heckman artist and activist. I think the homeless people get a bum rap and I wanted to talk about it and get something out to the people and uh, everybody think a little bit about how we treat uh, the homeless. In September, Heckman got Chicagoans thinking about racism with this billboard for the imaginary Afro Country Club where only the ball is white. I wanted white people to know what it feels like to be discriminated against. Heckman takes the techniques of advertising bright colors, bold graphics, double meanings to create giant political cartoons. 25 Heckman billboards have popped up in cities coast to coast, paid for by private backers. His signs protest the netting of dolphins. Flipper, the seafood tuna lovers are killing for. They scream about clear-cutting rainforests and even object to cigarettes carelessly dropped on menthol beach. I find something that starts really eating at me, and that's when it's time to do a painting and a billboard on it. The young artist supports himself selling traditional oil paintings, including a recent portrait of Gerald Ford for the state of Michigan. But Heckman's favorite canvas is the billboard, his preferred patron, the common man. I like communicating to the, you know, the worker, the guy that's driving down the street every day. And it's just important for me to talk to those people as the, the artsy fartsy, you know, buyers, you know. Heckman's next project is Bush Gardens, a billboard barb aimed at the president's environmental record. Like his other work, a warning sign designed to make people think at any speed. Chris Bury, ABC News, Chicago. And that's our report on World News Tonight. I'm Peter Jennings. Good night. Mark and I had talked about collaborating on a children's book for a long time. Mark loves superheroes, 
In his office, he had Spider-Man posters. He had Incredible Hulk figures. He even had a Batmobile cookie jar. He wanted to create a superhero to guard the Great Lakes. Why? 40 million people depend upon the Great Lakes for their drinking water. Do you drink water? Of course you do. Do you take a bath or shower? Well, I hope so. Clean water is important. Do you brush your teeth? Uh, I hope so. Clean water is obviously essential. Maybe you just like the outdoors. You enjoy swimming or fishing, boating, kayaking. Well, the Great Lakes is the largest freshwater system in the world. Mark wanted the main character to have his headquarters in Michigan's UP so he could be a Uper, someone from the Upper Peninsula. U for Upper, P for Peninsula. UP, Uper, UP, Uper. So he's a super Uper. In fact, his name is Billy Cooper, the super Uper. And that's the only rhyme in the first book because I'm not Dr. Seuss. So I didn't write the book in rhyme. Now Mark asked a very good question. He said, if he's a superhero, what superpower are we going to give him? I said, ooh, that is a really good question. So he made a long list of potential superpowers. Maybe he could breathe underwater. Maybe he could swim super fast. Maybe he's super strong. Or maybe he could communicate with animals, talk to fish. Maybe he's invisible. Maybe he could fly. Maybe he could shape shift and turn into other creatures. Become like an octopus, have eight arms. The longer we thought about it, the longer the list became. And finally we stopped and we said, wait a minute, there's already Aquaman and he's used some of these superpowers. And really when it comes down to it, who's gonna be responsible for guarding the Great Lakes? You and me. It's up to us to guard the Great Lakes. So we thought, let's make him like us. We won't give him one superpower. We'll say he's athletic and strong, good swimmer, but we wanted the message it's gonna be up to us to guard the Great Lakes. So instead we did something else. We gave him a super friend, a sidekick, an English bulldog named Mighty Mac, named after the Mackinac Bridge, which we call the Mighty Mac for Mackinac. So we have our hero, Billy Cooper, his assistant, Mighty Mac, he's sniffing out the problems. Well, for a good story, you need a villain. Well, the Great Lakes are filled with villains over 180 different invasive species. Now I use the word villains, technically they're not bad, they're not evil, but they don't belong. They're non-native species. So once they come in, scientists spend a lot of time, money, and effort either trying to control their movement, where they're gonna end up, or controlling their numbers, how many there are, so they don't ruin the five Great Lakes. One of the most famous invaders is the sea lamprey, which looks like an eel, acts like a leech, but it's actually a fish. This is one of the illustrations from our first book. It took Mark nearly two years to complete all the art. They were two very long years because Mark was very sick. He was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, so it was a struggle to finish the book. In fact, I kinda had to write the story around the art he was able to complete. He was in and out of the hospital. He's pretending to be happy here, but I can tell you he was not happy being super sick. And he was not the devil, but he wore that silly hat with the horns just to try to have fun with a not a very fun situation. He called me one day from the Mayo Clinic, a world famous hospital in Minnesota, and he was all upset on the phone. He asked me, have you sent the book to the printer? I said, I'm just about to send it because I thought we were all finished. He said, don't send it. I said, why not? He said, I can't believe I did this. I said, did what? What are you talking about? He said, look at my artwork of the sea lamprey. So I pulled out his painting, looked at it closely, and I said, what about the sea lamprey? He said, it's not the sea lamprey, it's Billy Cooper. I said, what about the super youper? He said, count his fingers. One, two, three, four, five, six. Uh-oh. Remember in the beginning I said that Mark never used a computer for his art? Well now it was a problem because he was so sick, he said, I don't think I have the strength left to fix it. In fact, he said, I'm not sure I have the time left to fix it. I said, Mark, no worries with a computer, watch what you can do. Now you see it, now you don't. Now you see it, now you don't. And when Mark saw it, 
He said, perfect, that'll work. We caught it just in time. So in the book, he has five fingers. That was a close call. Now that's the good part of the story. Here's the bad part. About two months later, Mark died. He never even got to see the book finished. Never even got to hold a completed copy in his hands. So that's a sad story. Super sad story. But maybe it has a little bit of a happy ending because his dream was to share the story of Billy Cooper, Mighty Mac, and invasive species with countless kids. And for the next decade, I shared his story during more than 800 school visits, reaching more than 188,000 students. After Mark passed, I figured that was the end of Super Youper. But I was at a Great Lakes conference when I met John Vandermolen, who was working in the water program at Grand Valley State University. He said, I love Super Youper. When is your next book coming out? I explained the circumstances, and he said, you have to do another book. There are so many invasive species, Billy Cooper needs some help. You should put together an environmental CSI team to investigate. I said, that's a great idea. You can be the first member of the team. I'll base all the characters on real superheroes who are working in the scientific field. I ended up doing all the artwork for Super Uper Quest of the Blue Crew with the help of Photoshop and filters. Remember, I'm a photographer. And with three of the characters in this book being played by women, I wanted a bit of a softer touch. So out of respect for Mark's style, I created a different look, which was a little more photorealistic, which was necessary to put eight characters in the same scene, especially when they were all scattered across the Great Lakes region. Eventually, I was commissioned by the Grand Rapids Art Museum to do another Super Uper book in conjunction with the show of Great Lakes murals by New York artist Alexis Rockman, telling his story of using art to address various environmental issues as he has dedicated his life traveling across a globe in crisis. Billy Cooper brings Alexis to the Great Lakes region to draw more attention to his cause. And I created the origin story called Super Uper Hero to Others, also known as H2O, to explain how a young boy became a superhero. I've enjoyed touring the Great Lakes states in Canada, hopefully inspiring future artists, writers, and scientists. And then the pandemic happened. The coronavirus changed everything, but it inspired me to create Super Uper TV, a YouTube channel with four to eight minute videos, each labeled with a case number as I investigate different invasive species. With new challenges, there are new opportunities. New invasive species, for example, means there is always more work to be done. Change can be good, and that is what makes life interesting.